Uh, kia ora everybody. Um, welcome to the um, second session that we are having as part of the new um, Hydropower Group. Um, this is obviously a series of uh, seminars, webinars that we are um, going to be continuing on into the new year um, about all things hydropower um, uh, through Engineer New Zealand. Um, so yeah, we're very fortunate uh, uh, this month to have um, Rob Shelton with us, um, who is TrustPower's gener Generation Enhancement Team Lead, um, whose kind of role is uh, looking at improving the performance of um, TrustPower's 39 hydro schemes around New Zealand. For his sins, he was originally a geologist, but don't hold that against him. Um, and he moved to the dark side of client, uh, client engineering and, and civil engineering through Auckland University. Um, he's worked internationally throughout Australia, New Zealand, the UK and Southeast Asia. Before joining TrustPower 11 years ago, so he must have come to New Zealand, back to New Zealand the same time I kind of moved here. He loves rivers, obviously like sticking hydro schemes on them, mountains, lakes, and small hydro. So a man after my own heart. Uh, in his spare time, Rob enjoys learning new things, tramping, mountain biking, gardening, and playing the violin. So um, Rob's going to talk about um, uh, Trust Parasit and his experience developing small hydro in New Zealand um, with lessons learned and developing the, the Toranui, the Rimu, and the Inchbonnie hydro schemes. Um, so he's going to just describe the three hydro schemes, uh, cover the planning, feasibility, consenting, design, procurement, and installation of the schemes. Um, there are kind of small, small hydros uh, with a station capacity of 1.4 to 2.8. So this probably follows on from our last um, presentation <coughs> around the, the schemes of Pioneer, um, following in the, the small hydro um, uh, basis, which is um, more what's been developed in New Zealand recently. And uh, I'm sure in the new year, we'll start looking at some uh, bigger stuff, maybe overseas. So look, you've probably heard enough about uh, from me. Um, you're all here to hear Rob. So um, Rob, I'll, I'll hand over to you. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you've got any questions, please chuck them in the Q&A. We'll try to um, answer as many of those as we can. And usually there's quite a few questions which overlap. So I'll, I'll try and combine those when, when we go back. So we'll leave about 15 minutes at the end there to um, to ask, answer those questions. So Rob, um, get over to you, mate. Cheers. That, thanks, Andrew. And, and thanks, Holly, for the introduction there. Uh, you'll see that there that I've branched uh, these into two, two groups, Rimu and Taranui. Uh, those are trust power stations combined, called the ESC scheme, on the west coast of the south um, of the of, of the North Island, and Inchbonny, which is a, a private scheme uh, on the South Island. So, going to the ESC scheme first, and and how it fits into trust power's portfolio. Um, what we have is thirty nine schemes throughout New Zealand, and um, they range from the, the larger ones, which are, are probably down here, Waipuri, uh, 84 megawatts, uh, Matahina, 80 megawatts. For us, that's large. For, for some of you, that's not large, but it is for us. Um, Coleridge, 39 megawatts, the size of the dots is, is pretty much the size of the scheme in terms of gigawatt hours. And the ESC scheme that I'll talk about here is, is our newest uh, scheme that we've purchased, uh, that we've built. 3.8 megawatts and it's just about uh, 40 kilometers inland from Napier on the on the east coast of the North Island. Uh, hydrology and consenting. Um, we were very fortunate that the consent for this was obtained by the landowner and I'll go into the landowner a little bit later on. But the hydrology, we spent a lot of time uh, doing uh, synthesizing of the hydrology for the two to the two main catchments and coming up with flow duration curves for for the consents and and for the scheme design uh, you'll see here that uh, probability of exceedance 10 percent is around about 0.8 um, both of the schemes are designed for one cumic so they're right up there on the um, on the flow duration curve so their actual mean uh, generation is, is about half a cumic, so around about half, 50% capacity factor. Um, Chris Pask was the original landowner and uh, he identified the scheme on his property and got advice from a number of quite uh, knowledgeable people, including um, Brian Leyland, people from Tonkin and Taylor, Unison, Meritech, 
Uh, a lot of work was done for four or five years before Trust Power became involved, um, mainly because I think it fitted better into our profile of schemes than it did to others. So Chris came to us and we arranged a, a, a royalty arrangement with him and then took over the ownership and development of the schemes. Uh, you can see the landscape prior to the scheme being built, um, quite erodible material. Uh, there is actually a layer of about 0.9 of a metre of volcanic ash and, and uh, pumice uh, over some parts of the landscape. Uh, the rivers have been incised in through this geology. Uh, and you can see that they're fairly, fairly gnarly with a lot of slips on them. Uh, none of that was to do with the hydro scheme, but uh, that gives you an idea of the erodibility of, of some of the material. So it was farmland, sheep and beef farming, uh, and this is what the scheme looks like on these two farms, Rimu Farm being this one on the side and Taranui being the one on this side. Uh, we did consider combining the two schemes into a, a cascade, as it were, uh, but for various reasons, that was not the optimum solution. Uh, so we uh, did them independently. And uh, there they are shown on the, that figure. During construction, you can see there's a bit more scarring to the landscape. Um, the lay down areas are here. Taranui Pond is being built here. And access roads are being built down to the, uh, to the stations. Really developed, I'd say, because we didn't put um, hard wearing course onto the access roads. Uh, really budget didn't permit us to do that. Um, we did pay a cost later on in terms of construction difficulty and working in mud, but um, it did save us nearly $300,000. And uh, there's the schemes overlaying on it. Now, this is actually what it looks like now without the scheme overlaying. You can see that basically the land is completely um, restored to its original um, use and uh, the penstocks are all buried. Um, the intakes are hidden or a very, very well. Uh, the pond is, is the nice water feature on the Taranui station, but really the land use is completely restored to its original purpose. And there's some parameters for the scheme. So the, uh, the Rimu intake is up around 808 metres, a 2.4 kilometre long penstock down to the Rimu powerhouse at 468 metres. This penstock is quite interesting. The first portion of it is quite flat, and that's done in 900 mil diameter GRP, transitioning to 700 mil. Uh, then down a steep section here, we went to 600 mil steel, then back to 600 mil HD, um, sorry, GRP, and then back down to steel at the bottom. So it was quite a lot of nesting of the penstocks was enabled for for bringing them to site. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with nesting, that is when you place in a smaller penstock inside larger penstocks for transportation. And in this case, we could put the, uh, the 900 on the outside, the 700 on the middle, and the 600 on the inside. So for one truckload, we could get three lengths of pipe to site. The Torrini scheme intake at 530 meters, powerhouse at 390 meters, so about 140 meter head on this scheme, and a 960 meter long penstock. So again, these runner river schemes that return the water back to the same river uh, tend to have quite long penstocks. This head of the schemes is quite different. This one from 808 down to 468 is around about 340 meters, which makes it, I think, about number six in New Zealand for head. Uh, whereas the Toronui is a relatively lower head at 140 metres. This is uh, the view of the site on a beautiful day uh, during construction with the lay down areas and the work areas here. Penstocks have been denested and laid out along here and uh, just beginning to get ready for construction of the job. Um, so starting up at the intakes. This is a very early ecological visit to the intakes, which went into the AEE for the consenting. Um, and you can see it's a beautiful uh, intake location at the bottom of a waterfall. Now, true hydrologists or true uh, hydropower engineers would say, why are you installing your intake at the bottom of a waterfall when you can actually get the head from the waterfall uh, added into your scheme? 
And the reason we did that is that the landowner liked the waterfall. And he said, I like this waterfall. I want you to keep it and I want you to put your intake at the bottom of it. So landowner, that was his choice. And uh, that's what we did. This is building the uh, access way into the Remu intake. Um, as you would have seen from Tony Jack uh, uh, last week or, or a couple of weeks ago, uh, building civil works into the uh, penstocks and into the intakes is, is quite costly and difficult in these, this terrain. And uh, our scheme was certainly no different to, to what Tony showed last week. The intake is situated right at the base of the waterfall in here. And the 900 mil pen stock is laid underneath the access road, right in on the inside of the bend, because this is often cut to fill. So we put the pen stock buried underneath the access way through here. And there is, believe it or not, a very gentle fall on that access way through to the descender in the top of the pen stock. Diggers in waterways these days, it's very, very hard to get approval to do that. And the environmental management plans for doing this work just had to go through the resource consenting process. But the Hawke's Bay Regional Council were quite pragmatic and they understood that if you're building this type of structure in a waterway, you do have to work in the waterway. Uh, the bypass for this is, is the pipes at the bottom, which you may see poking through here. They provided um, bypass for probably about 70% of the time. Uh, the rest of the time, the water would actually build up and could actually flow through the work site. That gave us a very short construction window for doing the construction works here. Um, the uh, base slab for the weir is anchored into the rocks with, with rock anchors. Um, oh, one thing you can see here is you can see how cold it is. Now, this is actually on a beautiful sunny day, but this waterfall did not see the light of sunlight almost any time. And uh, it was freezing cold, uh, typically one or two degrees uh, right through the building of this intake. And uh, people got very cold building it. Um, an aspect of the design of the weirs is that they were designed as um, low cost structures. Um, given how remote they are and how difficult it was to get concrete up there. So we have steel uprights here that are propped and you'll see in the final picture that there is a timber placed between them. The water level is up around here. This is a sluice gate for sluicing the gravel from behind here and the intake screens are just behind my mouse here. So the water comes in through the intake screens and then out through another gate into the penstock which you can just see on the bottom right. This is the weir uh, as it was uh, full. And what you can't quite see here is that the timber profile through the weir changes. So the bottom part of the weir is quite a robust thickness. It's about 125 mil thick on these timbers, but the ones on the top are only about 50 mil thick with a saw cut through them. Uh, this was again a cost saving measure to enable us to design a lightweight and, and economical structure for the weirs that in the event of a major flood, um, flood levels right up here, that it would enable the water to go right over the top and that these top boards would actually break and lower the load on the weir so that the weir didn't have to have a massive foundation structure to keep it in place. At the end of a big flood, you would simply come through and replace the boards and, uh, and you'd be back up and operating in a couple of days. So implementation of ESC on a, on a working farm, what you see there is dogs, um, quad bikes, sheep and pipes and mud. And uh, all of those work in consort on a wet day. And of course, on a cold day, it's covered in snow. So even in the upper, upper North Island, you do get uh, snow and very, very cold days. We also had the mud, which I referred to earlier. Um, this part of the country, it's very hard to get good rock for um, roads, extremely expensive. And uh, so we just learnt to work in the mud. Seems crazy in hindsight. Um, and I think one lesson learnt was we might have spent a bit more money on building the hard stands, but we just worked our way through this. And here you can see the the extent of the works areas need, needed for the job. And this is the beginning of the Toronoi being pond being built. 
and you'll see some photos of that later on. Access to the power stations was really only by, on good weather, four-wheel drive vehicles with chains on all four vehicles or by excavators. And so to get the 22 ton and 16 ton generators down to site, we had to skid them down uh, using bulldozers. Um, I was quite nervous about this operation because it was my responsibility for insurance purposes to ensure that this was safe for the installation of the generator. The point of delivery for the site was to here, um, but we had to get it from here down to the power station. So those are four very large excavators lifting a 22 ton um, generator, which was then pulled down to site using a D7 bulldozer on a skid. And uh, yep, quite difficult work. Here we see uh, the 16 ton generator um, arriving at the Toranui station at the bottom, uh, also visible is, is the penstock entering the station here, uh, the, the transformer stepping up from 3.3 to 33 kV, uh, the Viper um, uh, switch gear up on the poles and the 33 kV transmission lines out. There's a nice finish of the uh, of the Toranui pond with a water feature, which is where the Sutherland stream drops into it. The main intake from the Toranui intake uh, is on the side, and the outlet of the pond is here. Uh, you can see a, an overflow spillway, and you can also see a comms and controls hut. This uh, provides uh, satellite and radio comms to site. Uh, from here, we control the intake uh, for the flow into here, and also the uh, outlet and, and also the comms for the rest of the scheme. An overview of the, of the pond uh, near completion and uh, the Taranui intake is up on this side, the Sutherland intake is on this side and, and the water for Taranui heads on out. Uh, key for this scheme was, was the people and the relationships. Uh, what, who you see there is Chris Pask, so his was the land of Taranui station at the time and uh, Mark Prater is the uh, general manager uh, of MAP projects, who are the main civil contractors for the intakes, penstocks, pond, and uh, and the powerhouses. So they had a great relationship and uh, worked very, very well together. Uh, this gives you a little bit of an idea of the low environmental impact of this scheme. This flow through here was around about uh, 0.6 of a cubic at the time. And because the main river is uh, two kilometers upstream here, you can see the river has already um, improved from its 30 liters per second residual flow. It's probably flowing nearly 0.3 to 0.5 of a cubic there itself. So the impact on, on this reach of river is actually quite minimal because of the other inflows downstream of the main intake. Inside the powerhouse, you can see here the uh, vertical four jet Pelton machine for 300 and 40 meters head, a Pelton is, is the best solution, especially for a run of river scheme where you have a, quite a wide range of flows. If you remember the original flow duration curve, uh, it went from sort of 50 liters per second at a 5% at right up to um, 1.2 cumex. And a good thing about these Peltons is that you have four jets that are firing in 250 liters per second each. And uh, each of those jets is efficient right down to about 20% of its flow. So that means that each jet can is quite efficient down to about 50 liters per second. So that gives the uh, Pelton turbine a very good operational range right from 50 liters per second right up to one cumic. Uh, and that's very useful for a run of river scheme where you can't control the flow uh, very well through the range. Um, vertical vertical mounted generator, uh, which means that the shaft is vertical. The shaft runs through the generator into the, um, the turbine casing and the runner, the Pelton runner, which you'll see in the next photo is inside here. This is just a view from underneath of the Pelton runner. So you can see here the four jets, one, two, three, four jets and the runner. So the water hits the buckets uh, splits the flow and the flow then drops into this void underneath and that spins the runner 
which spins the shaft and the generator. Uh, these were running at 750 and 1000 RPM, uh, which is a, a fairly you know, reasonable speed for a Pelton machine. Nothing like an opening ceremony for people to be happy. Uh, here you can see uh, Chris Pask, uh, Dennis, uh, the owner of the Remu station, and our then CEO, Vince Hawksworth. Uh, Vince is now CEO of, of Mercury Energy. One interesting thing here is this, this Remu board, which uh, houses the original switch gear from the Amethyst, original Amethyst station on the west coast of the South Island. And uh, it's been used now to open two or three power stations of, of Run of River. And uh, interestingly enough for the folk who were there, as we, we closed the breaker and uh, immediately we heard the, 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 the main inlet valve opening and, and, and the machine starting to wind up. And people were intrigued as to how we did this. And we told them it was wireless. Uh, but of course the wireless was John Hind in the control room pushing the button when he saw Vince close the breaker because we didn't actually have fiber optics to that old breaker. Uh, here you see just the opening ceremony with a you know, great local participation, a lot of stakeholders involved in this scheme. You know, people from SKM who did the main civil design for us, Brian Priggan was a key person there, uh, right through to Mitten Electronet who did the mechanical as uh, the electrical design for us, through to HydroWorks for the uh, and Allied Industrial Engineering who did the turbine supply uh, and design. So these are real community projects. You know, we were working up there for nearly two years to get this project completed. So that's that's the first one. Um, now I'd like to just move on to Inchbonny Hydro. Um, I, was, I was fortunate enough that Trust Power allowed me to have an involvement in this scheme, uh, which was going ahead anyhow. So they didn't see any conflict of interest. So they allowed me to uh, help on the scheme in my spare time which I did. The key people who are involved in it, of course, are Dave Mackay, Richard Press and Paul Steig, who are the main shareholders. Brian Leyland provided some early advice uh, to, to the lenders engineers. Um, Electronet Services, HydroWorks, West Power. Ian McCann was very helpful on the intakes and, and many others. So some acknowledgement to those folk. Um, Brian, Richard and, and Dave have, have previously presented a paper internationally on this, on this project, but I'll do this mostly with with photos, but where is it? So Inchbonny is on the, uh, the west coast of the South Island. The reason I've chosen this Google Earth image is that it shows very well the Alpine Fault. And if you follow it through here, you can actually see it going through, through the step on Echelon Step and running right through Inchbonny and continuing on down to Fiordland. And of course, this is the, the main active fault of New Zealand, which is forecast to have a major event on it. Uh, sometime in the next 50 years, and uh, it uh, has quite significant seismic events on it. So building a power station there, of course, the seismic issues were of a key concern. Looking at the, the, the scheme in a little bit more detail, you have two hanging glacial valleys here, which are really interesting. Uh, Lake Julia and Lake Ida are in the valleys, and uh, they've got lovely glacial features. And this mountain range is the Hohanui range, which is um, granite because it's on the west side of the Alpine Fault. Uh, there's one intake on this valley here and one intake on this valley here of similar size. So the Rubislaw intake is around uh, 370 metres above the power station. The Johnston's is about 340 metres above. So there's a 25 metre elevation difference between the two intakes, which means of course that the scheme is shut down and both of them are open, then this water can theoretically back up and, and, and spill out here, which it does do. Um, the two penstocks are quite interesting, uh, as is the joined on penstock. So here's a bit of a, a process flow diagram just showing for those of you who are um, interested in penstocks and, and how the scheme is designed. So the intakes are Coanda screen intakes at the top, one on either side. So I'll just refer to one side because they're more or less identical. Um, each one is capable of taking um, about 600 litres per second, although they only need to provide about 360 for the, for the required generation flow. 
the water that flows into a, a tank, a steel tank that was prefabricated in steel section and flown up to site with an internal weir which drops the water into the penstock. There's an overflow weir for spill, which uh, you can see the parameters for here as to uh, how much overflow we get. If we open the sluice, we have a local sluice here and uh, that will dewater the desander completely and will keep the water out of the penstocks. So the sluice is also a bypass. We have good instrumentation up at the intakes, residual flows in the streams, as well as pressure transducers upstream and downstream of the of the weirs and, and a local power supply there. And moving on to the penstocks, uh, 400 mil diameter penstocks, ranging from PN6 to PN12.5, 750 meters long on one side and 888 meters long on the other side. Uh, later on, I'll go into the penstock installation, but essentially this one was pulled up in two sections. The first section was pulled all the way up from here up to the top, then the next section was pulled up all the way up from here, joined here and finished here. The next section was pulled all the way up right up to the top on this side with a join here. Then the next section was pulled up all the way along with a join here. Finally, a bifurcation. Then the last section was pulled up. So each of those sections is between 300 and 400 meters long of HDPE pipeline pulled through the bush. Uh, we then join the steel um, after the after the PN500. So that's pretty interesting. It's, as far as I know, it's the highest head HDPE pen stock in the Southern Hemisphere. I might be wrong, but uh, it's uh, 500 mil diameter uh, and PN20, which means that the HDPE at the 200 bar mark um, at the 20 bar mark has uh, a wall thickness of 55 millimeters, which is very high. Uh, then we go down to a 450 mil steel section down to the powerhouse. Um, so there's the key parameters of, of the scheme in, in that photo, in that PFD. So moving on to the weir construction, there's the weir before the commander screens are installed. We made some really nice bell mouths uh, to ensure that we could get the full capacity uh, of the um, of the intake through to the desander. And uh, here you can see the other intake that is completed with the coanda intake working. You can see the, you can't see the water flowing over, but I've got a video of it coming up. But you can see the, how far the water is coming down the intake. So this is probably at only a third of capacity, but uh, this isn't spilled. This is the compensation flow of 30 liters per second. Uh, but the other 200 liters per second is just getting sucked into that coanda screen intake. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with coanda screens, they're, they're a wedge wire screen with a screen spacing going across the weir, only two millimeter spacing between uh, these particular screen blades and they're self-cleaning. So uh, twigs or sticks will stay on the screen and they just get washed off. So moving on, uh, the screen with a bit of water going through it. And this is the, the, the Rubus Law screen with it before it was completed. Um, and, and here's the, the uh, intake pipe getting off the, on the side. This is the uh, HDPE uh, intake pipe heading from the intake through down to the uh, descender. Now, I mentioned earlier pulling the penstock up through the bush. Um, this is beautiful dock reserve bush through here. It's a Potocup forest, um, virgin rimu and totara trees in this area. Some of it areas down had been logged, but this area has not been logged. And we were really keen to install these pen stocks with minimal value, minimal impact. So we basically made up 80 meter long strings of HDPE pipe. Then we pulled, put winches way up in the bush, right up at the very top and we started to pull them up. So we have to pull them up initially part way, reset the winches, pull them up further part way and all the way up to the top. Um, inclement weather, high, high altitudes in the South Island, um, very cold and, and difficult working conditions also. 
Uh, this is just a, a, the, the pulling head on, on the HDPE pipeline as it's pulled up. This is pretty sophisticated stuff. It doesn't seem it, but this is actually um, Dyme, Dyneema uh, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene um, rope, 760 meter length of it. Um, um, a safe working load of 10 tonne on, on one strand of that rope. Uh, we double parted it or four parted it so we could pull up to 40 tonne um, pull capacity on that rope with a, our special uh, winch that we got made up for the job. The winch was flown in by helicopter um, and it was just within the 750 kilo weight of, of a squirrel helicopter. So installing those penstocks through the bush was, was a really difficult task and it took a long time with a team of about three to five people working on it. But here you can see the result um, of, of, of the penstock just lying on the bed of the forest. It does have special supports in different locations. You may see those later on. Um, basically supported every seven to eight meters. We did design that carefully. Uh, Rick Press is a very good mechanical engineer who designed the uh, maximum allowable spans for this both radially and, and vertically. Flying in the steel penstocks, uh, one innovation we had here, we did consider GRP for these penstocks, but uh, we uh, chose steel for constructability and, and also because of the supports. Uh, this is the supports that are on this very hard glacial rock. They're typically anchored in. This is a sliding support. But one innovation is that we only have one support every pipe. So you can see the coupler here. Um, this pipe is supported on this side. Um, and there is not a support until it joins the coupler on the other end, and then there's another support. So it basically halved the number of supports we were able to, to needed for this penstock. Another innovation is springs. I'm not sure how many of you have seen springs on a penstock before, but this steel penstock only has two anchor blocks on the whole uh, penstock, and it is able to slide on all supports um, in between those anchor blocks. And uh, this spring and its neighbor on the other side are pulling the penstock back up the slope to stop it creeping down beyond the uh, movement capacity of the Victolic uh, couplers. So we have two types of Victolic couplers and they both allow a little, one allows a little bit of movement. Here's a view of the penstock heading down towards the river. I'll just check for time. I'm still going okay. Um, and, and you can see the typical pipe supports heading down towards the power station. This is moving down towards the lower anchor block, which was, um, I designed this anchored into, into granite boulders, um, very large boulders. And uh, we, we, we just epoxied in large anchors into that to, 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 to give us a, a very good, large combined mass. Into the powerhouse. Um, this is a, a quite a novel design by Electronet Services. Um, and Etel provided the, 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 the transformer and switch gear. Um, it, it's apparently it's it's touchable, the switch gear. Um, so so uh, Roger Griffiths assures me I have not endeavored to touch anything, but uh, the high voltage and, uh, and the switch gear and the transformer are all within this enclosure. It's very similar to what people see on wind farms in some instances. Uh, the generator is at 690 volts and it steps up to 11 kV here. This is the local service transformer in the powerhouse. The powerhouse is a tilt slab construction uh, with a removable roof so that we can lift in the generator if we need to. Bit of an overview of the powerhouse at the bottom, the tail race on this side uh, running through. And there's just a, a small portion of the steel penstock running up into the distance, probably goes a similar distance before it transitions to the PE penstock. Inside the powerhouse, we have a man by the name of Russell Peoples in this photo. I don't know if Russell's watching today, but sorry if you are, Russell. Um, here is uh, the bifurcation uh, of the branches into the twin jet horizontal Pelton turbine uh, for this scheme. And uh, an overview of, of the of the equipment inside the powerhouse. You can see it's quite compact. Again, a Morelli generator, uh, generating at 690 volts, uh, good air and lit here, some, some very nice louvers on the side of the building and inducted air out of the building. 
Uh, we've put some, some sensors on this air so that we can keep the building very clean um, with the ducting coming in. Uh, the temperature ranges on this power station go from about minus 10 degrees up to plus 30 degrees. So having this, this ducting uh, thermally controlled to keep the powerhouse pretty much maximum 28 degrees in the middle of summer um, and, and a nice 18 to 22 degrees in winter. Moving over the main inlet valve with a counterweight closure that protects the, uh, the turbine in the event of a penstock rupture or anything else. Um, the HPU, sorry, which I'll just go back to, uh, a twin unit HPU. Those of you who know Pelton's will understand how, how this works, but uh, twin motors, a duty and a standby, they are used to control both the, uh, the nozzles and the deflectors inside the penstock inside the turbine and also the main unlet valve. Um, main control systems for this, uh, AVR is a DEX 100. Um, we've got a, a Magellus and, and, a, and a PLC on it. I think, what do we have on the scheme? I'm just trying to remember. Yeah, it's a Schneider PLC and just a cell 700G protection relay. Uh, all the comms and batteries and UPS systems that are needed for the scheme. We actually run fiber optics from the powerhouse right up to each of the intakes. And we have local Wi-Fi set up at each of the intakes so that we can, can control the scheme from up at the intakes if necessary. This is the volume of water that is bringing through uh, about, about eight, seven or 800 kilowatts at, at this photo. Um, here's the Magellus screen, which we, we can get on our phones. We can actually control the scheme from, from a, a mobile phone. Um, and this is the typical operating parameters for the scheme uh, prior to a, a modest upgrade we've made recently with increasing some, mod, some uh, nozzle plates. We're now getting uh, about, about 1750 uh, kilowatts out of the scheme. That gives you an idea of the head loss, uh, 31 bar here. Uh, don't forget that uh, Rubus law was around 335 bar, so that's about a four bar head loss over 10% at full output, um, which is you know, slightly high for, a, for um, a run of river scheme, but given the difficulties of installing the penstocks, this was the most economic design we could come up with. Now, one thing that I'll mention is this thing, it's a, it's a pig. And what we found is that the, the, the generation was dropping off with time. And we designed the penstocks with a certain roughness on them, uh, which was for you know slightly fouled um, HDPE or steel. But we found that this was dropping down from the original um, 1700, it was dropping down to around 1520 kilowatts over a period of nine months. And what was happening is algae was forming inside the HDPE instead of steel penstocks. And because the penstocks are so long, um, if you look at the length of them and you add them all up, um, it's, a, it's a good couple of kilometers of penstocks and they're relatively um, small diameter and high velocities. That was actually causing a, a reduction in output at the power station. So what we've done is we've pigged the penstocks. And I'm not too familiar with many other operators who do pig their penstocks. Uh, I thought I'd just describe to you how it happens because it's very interesting. And what we do is, is we introduce one of those pigs that you saw into the penstock with a rope on it and we flush water down here. So we dewater the penstock to start with and we actually flush water down the penstock and push the pig down to the bifurcation. Uh, we then open up this one and we fill the penstock up to here and then we start push, raising the water level up all the way and we push the pig back up to this desander. And it will actually come all the way up with the 20 meters extra head. And that's cleaned this arm of the penstock. We then do the same thing from here. We push a pig into here, uh, lower it down to here with water coming behind it to push it down. Uh, we then open this one up and we push it backwards. Um, by, after we've drained the penstock, we would push it backwards three quarters of the way and then winch it out. And I'll show you that operation in a little video at the end. We repeat this operation from here by flushing a pig from here down to the next section and back up and then 
the final section also. And that actually gets us back to full output and it takes two eight hour days to do that. Um, and considering what you're gaining in terms of a 15% loss in power, those two days are very well spent and we can actually put the, the scheme back online overnight. And that's what one of the brush pigs looks like. So videos, I do have a couple of videos. I think for time, I'm just okay. So I'll just go to those. So the first one, uh, now just let me know if it's not showing, Andrew. But is that showing? So this is the Coanda screen at full output. Uh, that's taking in about seven or 800 liters per second. There's the residual flow. This is the riverbed, which is obviously faces very high flood flows. And uh, what you see there is, is the uh, intake pipe, which has been bolted to the side of the river and heading out. Uh, so this is a pool downstream, which is where we measure our residual flow. One thing on all these schemes is you have to do everything. You have to do hydrology, you have to do consenting, you have to do comms controls, everything. So it's kind of interesting. Um, the next one I'll just quickly show you is of the piggy. Oh, this is the uh, the uh, power spout, which is the small mini hydros at each of the intakes. I might just have to restart that one. Didn't seem to have started. Just one second. So this is, uh, if you Google it, Power Spout is a New Zealand company, and they're now uh, designing and manufacturing these turbines um, for all around the world. And uh, they're, they're really good. This one produces about uh, 100, 100 watts or so, which is more than what we need for our comms and controls up at the power station, and uh, incredibly reliable. So uh, I certainly, I recommend those to anyone who wants one. Uh, the next photo bar one, the video bar one, is just of this pigging operation. So this is pulling the pig back up, and this is the desander. This is Dave Mackay here, um, a capstan chainsaw winch, and that's pulling the pig back up to that uh, that intake chamber. So this is the intake chamber. There's a weir across this far end. Um, there's an overflow where on this side the water comes in here and goes out. So that's pulling the pig back up. And this is our little controls hut, which we have Wi Fi and power supplies on. So just looking back to my last video, which hopefully is okay for time, is uh, just what the pen stock looks like um, through the bush. And uh, you can see it's laid on the, on the, on the, on the, on the floor, except where it's got uh, support. Beautiful podocop forest in the dock reserve. Um, there's the fiber optic cable running up through the path. And there is the, uh, the penstock running through the beautiful Totara um, and, and Rimu native bush on the South Island. You can see just walking access along the side. Um, we didn't cut any trees bigger than this diameter as agreed with our dock consent um, and this is really minimum impact small hydro so i think that that is probably about me for timing i'll just see if i can go back to the video and then questions and yeah open for any questions if, if you happen to have any andrew yeah we, uh, we got a few rob um yeah interesting on the pigging because it was certainly very common in scotland on the schemes that i used to get involved in you know specifically with the peat kind of build up on the inside of penstocks for the high peat water, but we didn't use to winch them back up with brushes. We just fired torpedoes down and caught them at the bottom in a big <laughs> in a big bucket. Mm. It's the best bit of the job, to be honest. <laughs> it was good fun. So um but no, yeah, it's similar. Yeah, obviously it's not very common in New Zealand. So we're really um really interested to see it's done here. So yeah, we've got quite a few questions. We've got about 15 minutes. So we'll try and get through um uh some questions on that. Um I think it's specific to ask somebody's asking um were there any specific earthquake mitigation measures needed on on that project the relative high seismicity i suppose that follows on to the inch scheme as well you know specific requirements around seismic 
Yes, so so the penstock design and and the powerhouses were both designed um, by SKM, and uh, the penstock stress analysis did take into account seismic accelerations as well as the operational loads. Um, to tell the truth, we actually found that the potential for earth creep and movement was uh, as big a concern for us as was seismic loadings. Um, I've my previous background was was in pipeline design for 20, 25 years before I moved into hydropower and um, pipelines are inherently very good in in, in seismic events uh, as long linear structures and uh, yes so they were considered and they were designed for and and also the powerhouses yep um, I suppose uh, one more on the environmental consenting planning side so this um, feel interesting around the envi main and environmental hurdles on the schemes and following on from that you know uh, some bit of chat around how your consultation with EV went and how you handled that so yep okay so so the consenting for ESC was was really good in that uh, most of it was uh, completed or it was certainly started before Trust Power purchased the scheme and and, and developed it um, ourselves. So the resource consent, Chris Pask had actually already obtained that. And uh, he did that in conjunction with uh, a couple of consultants. And uh, there were no real issues with it, mainly because the rivers downstream of the two intakes uh, are also very steep uh, and, and, and have some waterfall structures. So there was no issues with um, native passage what we did have is we had a well sorry for native passage we did have a requirement to keep the face of the weirs wet for alva alva passage and so it was quite fortunate that the weirs all leak and uh, that provides natural flow of of of, of water for alva passage but uh, i guess the main thing was sediment control on esk was that was the, the main issue that we had to spend quite a bit of time with with the regional authority and building um, salt fences and, and salt traps uh, inch bonnie on the west coast um, dave mckay looked after the consenting of that and employed local consultants who in a way were not, not recommended by the local authority but he asked them who who were the best consultants to use in the area and they provided a couple of names and those people proved to be very well um, um, capable of doing that work uh, so yeah no no significant issues and uh, only minor iwi consultations these were consented about 12 years ago and eight years ago and i think that even now, um, there's a lot more iwi consultation than there was at that time. And of course, with the national policy statement on freshwater management, uh, there's there's even more environmental work. Um, so the barriers being raised all the time, um, but small hydro, because it doesn't store a lot of water and because it has relatively benign um, impacts, is, is looked on pretty favorably for consenting. Oh, that's good. Um, so I think, um... People asking, um, given the challenges of sites and risks, I say I ask, you know, a trust power considering other similar small hydro developments at the minute? Um, I'm looking after the enhancement team, which is looking at improving our existing assets. Um, that, that actually seems to be providing um, better returns on investment than new small hydro for us at the moment. That's not to say that we aren't keeping our eyes open for more good opportunities to do small hydro, but small hydro is very hard to do economically, um, Andrew, we, and, and, and everyone. You know, when you're competing against uh, wind which and, and geothermal, which have long run marginal costs of maybe 65 or even $60 a, a megawatt hour, um, that, that's very hard to do for hydro schemes uh, in, in, in the current environment. And you really have to get one like an ESC or an inch bonnie where the things all align, where it, where it be it consenting land access, uh, transmission. Transmission is a big factor for both of these projects. They both involved upgrading 20 kilometers of transmission lines into them. So I we're, we're certainly open to it, but to tell the truth, we don't have any 
live prospects for new small hydro at the moment other than enhancing our existing schemes which which enable us to lever, leverage on our existing assets yeah uh, as being a small hydro engineer myself um, yeah i can appreciate the challenges uh, when you don't have um, things like feed-in tariffs etc so um quite a few questions regarding um pen stocks um uh, so one here from uh oh, did, where's it gone um chris mann uh, was asking around corrosion protection on the steel pen stocks and um what those expected life is um and then following on from that inch bonnie did you account for tree deadfall obviously winding that you know pen stock <laughs> like a snake through the forest there um yeah and then um uh, Brian was asking about the rope and timber penstock supports. Um, and then somebody's also asking about the expected life of the HDPE. So just some general penstock questions there. So Okay, well, I, I find when I, get, goes off. <laughs> when, when I get multiple questions, I have to write them down, Andrew. So uh, uh, me both. I, <laughs> yeah, so, so steel cathodic protection for, for ESC. Um, yes, uh, Chris definitely considered. Uh, we put a, a really good... Um, two coat epoxy uh, on those, I think 350 micron. Um, we had some issues with the supply of the steel pen stocks for ESC, and we actually um, rejected the first lot because the paint was defective. Uh, it had been applied uh, incorrectly in, in, in the mill. Uh, it, had, it didn't bond properly, and I actually rejected the whole lot and got it replaced. So we, we did place a great concern on having the first primary corrosion barrier of internal and ex external um, uh, paint, but we did actually install cathodic protection on the buried sections of, of the ESC pen stocks as well. Um, we designed a, um, an, a, a sacrificial anode solution that uh, used magnesium alloy ground beds and um, and, and polarized the, the pen stocks uh, in, in, in two different sections. Uh, and then we might have monitoring points on that. So we, we did do CP for the steel pen stocks, and that's how corrosion protection was mitigated for those. Um, regarding the uh, rope and timber supports, yeah, Brian and, and the tree fall, um, Rick Press is, is a very good mechanical engineer um, from X from my Ecom, and uh, he did a lot of work on the resilience of the HDPE pen stocks to loadings, both from uh, the sag loadings just between supports, and we came up with safe support distances, as well as the allowable bend radius. Um, and these these pipes are very very strong at, at PN16, PN20, or even PN12. You know, you've got very very thick HDPE pipe, um, and so. Uh, I can't say that we designed a, a, an allowable tree deadfall, uh, but what we do have is we have automatic shut off on the pen stocks that if in the event of a rupture and a loss of pen stock pressure, we will trip both intakes immediately. Um, the rope and timber posts, obviously Brian is fully aware of these. Um, Dave Mackay, um, the, the, the main person for Inch Bonnie, is, is an ex uh, New Zealand representative sailor and an amazing man with tying ropes and ropes people think of as ropes but these are actually engineered and designed connections and uh, the timber supports for, for the pen stock are often able to move um, but within limits and they are held back with ropes or chains to large block large rocks and large trees but each one of them is actually engineered and uh, you know, with the use of Dyema rope and also the very strong polyester rope with safe weight breaking strains, um, those are actually very robust um, supports. Um, in re regard to the HDPE life, um, we were assured that it was at least 50 years um, and it is UV stabilized. Um, and also the, the, the Dyema rope um, actually has a UV stabilized outer layer on it as well. So yeah, that's those questions. I'm going to selfishly ask one myself. Um, um, I know it's, you obviously put coandas on um, Inch Bonnie, and of course the idea of moving coandas is to screen to a very kind of fine level, but then I noticed you also had um, sand sand traps as well. Um, uh, it was that kind of, um, you know, a bit of an over overkill, or did you have specific issues of very fine sediments, which would have caused, er caused erosion as well? So. 
Um, yeah, so I guess we, we called them sand traps. Um, and and they, the idea is that if anything did escape in, that, that it would get retained there. But the reality is, is that with the coanda screens, uh, Andrew, we, we have not needed to use them for, for any sediment buildup at all. What we did size them for is, as we get, again, I've used quite a bit of input from, from Brian Leyland's small hydropower engineering book, uh, Sheep. And uh, we actually did size those tanks uh, to provide us with a stable head pond level based upon the inflows and outflows so that we can control the, the, the scheme very well on, on, on head pond level control. So in a way, what they are is they're providing us a head pond. Yeah. Do you get, uh, this answers one of the questions, um, the intakes are slightly different levels. So do you, do you get water transferring between the two intakes ever at all? Um, or are they kind of re re relatively balanced? Um, so they're relatively balanced. Um, the Rubus Lord Penn State because it's as higher, um, does tend to provide more water if it has the water. Uh, we control the scheme off the Johnston's uh, pen stock, uh, intake, which is a little bit lower. And uh, yes, yeah, so, so, so the flows, we, we can't tell which proportion of the flow is going from which, except that we know the flow over the Johnston's weir. So the lower one, we have a, a set point on the weir that controls the, uh, the machine setting. We know the flow over that weir, so we do know the proportion that is coming from Johnston's, and we can back calculate the Ruber's Law flow from that, and it typically is a bit higher. What it does mean is it means that the water in the Ruber's Law penstock will actually drain down the penstock until it is matching the same level as Johnston's, so we'll have open channel flow in the pipe until it reaches uh, the, the, the hydrostatic level, and then they both feed from there. Yes, yeah, it's, it's almost identical to a project I did in Scotland, so I love chat with you offline about that. It's scary, even the capacity is almost exactly the same double intakes. Um, yeah, I think another one, um, um, during a flood, um, uh, you know, obviously you're going to get a, a top uh, a break on the ESC scheme. Um, yeah, it's obviously designed not to cause too much of a kind of rush uh, downstream, but um, has that happened often? Um, have you had to fix that intake much in, over the years or has it not been too regular? Yeah, I, I think we've only had to fix one of the intakes once and that was when a big log came down and, and basically just broke through um, the, 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 the top boards, which was good. Um, but it did also bend one of the uh, steel stanchions, which, which needed to be replaced. Um, so we did have to take the boards off, uh, well, in fact, open the sluice gate and, and do that. So it's only happened once. Um, and uh, really once, once it, it won't happen until the weirs are overtopped by about 600 mil, which means that you've probably got, you know, 10 or 15 cumex going down the river anyhow. So the additional flow from the breaking boards progressive um, wouldn't be a big rush. Okay. Well, I've got about two minutes left, so we'll probably um, wrap it up there. Um, I know there's a couple of questions outstanding there, um, and we'll try and answer those. Um, if you're really desperate to drop the slide, I'm sure between Rob and myself, we can we can answer those. So, look, um, first of all, Rob, thank you very much. That was super interesting, and um, always good to um, see some stuff about uh, small hydro in New Zealand. Um, I just encourage everybody, um, you know, this is the type of material we're going to be looking to present um, in the future. Please join the group. Um, you know, we are planning a series of events um, in the new year, um, including a small conference towards the end of the year. We are going to be looking to uh, obviously do a number more of these types of presentations. And that's why we love hydro, because it brings in all kinds of aspects of, of engineering. So um, <clears throat> look, we're you know, always super excited to see how many people turn up for these. And yeah, just continue to, to dial in and, and learn um, lots about um, uh, hydropower. So yeah, look, well, thanks again, Rob. I appreciate the time and effort to do this. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks to everyone for dialing in and uh, look forward to um, some more events. Um, we might squeeze another one in the, uh, before the new year, um, but definitely in the new year. So thanks to everybody. Yeah, thanks, bye.